pain laced through Roderick's leg as he ran alongside Donna and Sarah. When the Vosslanders surprised them, Henrietta swooned. With her fainted, the three Calandrians retreated. Now they rushed through the tents toward Azure Fortress, hoping that the one patrol was the only one that followed them. The agony seeping out of his leg wound increased with every step. Roderick's heart sank. The alarm bell. Now, every able-bodied person in the camp would be looking for them. Sarah laughed darkly. Uh, this is just like when I stabbed the prince in the neck. Donna looked at her companion, confused. What now? Oh, that's how I revealed my identity. By stabbing Giacomo Zorzi. Roderick snorted in disbelief. Why did you not go for his brother? Uh, long story. Sarah seized a torch as the three continued their way through the camp. The patrol which had initially chased them was still far behind. They skidded to a halt to catch their breath. Roderick looked at his leg and groaned, partially in pain, partly because he knew what the obvious solution was. We need to split up. The two women looked puzzled, but Donna looked annoyed as well. Tis a whit too late to turn back now. Roderick shook his head. No, I just not. Look! He pulled back his trouser leg, revealing the crossbow bolt protruding from his right leg. The sentry earlier caught me unawares. I'm creating a trail that will lead them straight for us. I can lead them astray with it, though. Donna frowned at her companion. Her hesitation spoke volumes to Roderick. A few days ago, she would have gladly accepted his offer to let him be the decoy, but she looked at him now with surprise. Sarah broke the moment by thrusting a pair of torches into Donna and Roderick's hands. Here, we have no need to leave anyone behind today. Throw them. The Vosslin patrol rushed around a corner of a tent, and they spotted their quarry. Sarah backed up slowly, followed by the other two. When I say now... The Vosslanders rushed forward. Now! Roderick, Donna, and Sarah hurled their torches onto tents. The patrol froze in fear. The realization hit them like a dragon coming to perch on a sparrow. Sarah tapped Roderick and Donna on their shoulders. Come on, tis time to run again. The three Calandrians rushed off. As they disappeared deeper into the camp, fire appeared where they threw the torches. Each one of them seized another torch, lighting tents along their way. As the Calandrians rushed through the Vosselin army's camp, they lit fire after fire. Soon, a third of the camp was burning. But through their retreat, Roderick couldn't help but acknowledge the one chilling question on his mind. Where are all the soldiers? Where are all the soldiers? Nathan posed this question aloud as he stood atop the battlements of the secondary wall. Hours had passed since the Calandrians had barely beaten back the Vosselian cavalry. Yet Nathan felt a profound sense of unease during the winter night. Sir Ian Lightstone stood alongside him, staring out across the remains of the battlefield. He took a swig from a water skin. He offered it to Nathan, but Nathan shook his head. A hiding just out of sight, I reckon. We won today. Let that be enough for you, Nathan. Nathan shook his head. It seems like we won, but we merely forestalled defeat. The Empire of Vosselin has yet to try us with the full force of their might. I have seen the full force of their might, brother, in Simon and Artemisia, the twin forces of destruction that can wreak havoc on all. They have no need for his power or her cunning. They have the numbers. They have thousands of men they are willing to let die to see us crumble. So why would they pull back now? Sir Ian shrugged. I know not, Nathan. Nathan growled in frustration, clearly not satisfied by the answer. He stood atop the ramparts, scanning the battlefield. Healers from both armies waded through the corpses, sorting the living from the deceased. 
painstaking and grisly work, though it was, Nathan recognized its necessity, not only for sentimental reasons, but also in a practical sense. As bodies piled up, it became harder to fight. It stood to reason that tidying up was necessary between bouts to keep the killing efficient. Nathan's eyes drooped closed whilst he stood on the battlefield. He saw stars and galaxies fly before him. His mind went blank and he went into the void wherein there was no war or conflict. It was where his memories from his former life resided, a place of nothingness. Nathan's body vanished from his awareness, and all he saw around himself was the stretching infinity of his memory. A seated figure appeared before him in the void. Nathan's disembodied form swam towards it. The closer he drew toward it, he heard a humming. The figure was singing a tune. He recognized her voice. Priscilla Hayfield sat on a stool, adrift amid the sea of blackness. She sewed a brown tunic. She hummed to herself a melody. Nathan couldn't recall the song's name or any of its words, but the notes stirred his soul in ways that the conscious mind could not interpret. He found his senses filled with smells of his infancy, hot fires, laughter, a plump cooked pheasant. He drifted closer to his mother. She didn't look at him, but she spoke. Who are you? Her humming continued, even as she spoke. Y you know me, mother. I know you not. My son was replaced by the killer. Now... The killer asks questions. Are you the demon knight or my lost son? The peaceful void suddenly felt as cold as ice. Uh, I know not. All I know is that I can do good. Good for whom? The Vaslians? You saved only one of your comrades in Skylerland. And... One shall have to do for now. I have more souls to save by ending this war. Priscilla shook her head. The humming got louder. You wish not to end this war. You wish to fight it. Nathan peered at her. Who are you? M my dead mother? Or the spirit who comes to torment me with guilt or fear when my energy is at its weakest? She looked up at him for the first time. Her eyes were inky black spheres. I am both. A cold hand grasped Nathan on his shoulder. Nathan's eyes flew open. He whirled around. His sister, Amelia, raised her hands peaceably. Worry not, Nathan. Tis only I. Nathan let out a deep sigh and rubbed his eyes. The silvery moonlight had given way to the unwelcome gray of early morning. Amelia stood before him, her dress smeared with blood. Nathan, are you well? Aye, sister. I meditated the night away, I suppose. You might get better rest on a bed, even the ones here. Nathan laughed. <laughs> when the battle is done, I might. How are the wounded? Amelia smiled. Well cared for, at least for now. I worry more for those still yet to fight. At least those recovering have seen the worst of it through. Nathan nodded. He turned back toward the battlefield. He furrowed his brow in confusion. Where are the Vaslians? Amelia shrugged. Uh, I know not. We expected them to attack at first light, but that's less than an hour away. We cannot read their minds. We can only prepare ourselves for what they bring. A terrible thought struck Nathan. He turned and clutched Amelia by the shoulder. I'm such a fool! Amelia looked at him, astonished. What is it? Nathan's eyes widened as he blinked rapidly. Get everyone off the wall, now! Rouse Sir Ian, Duke Godrickson, everyone! He turned. Amelia grabbed him by the arm. 
Nathan, tell me what this is about. They haven't retreated. They never did. They just needed the time. She let go of her brother, and he leaped toward the battlefield. He shouted a parting word at Amelia. Get everyone off the wall! Nathan landed in front of the second wall, knelt, and placed his fingers on the dirt. He closed his eyes, focusing every bit of his exceptional senses on the soil. He heard faint sounds of metal scraping against rock through the thick, compacted soil, and hushed voices muffled by feet of dirt. His eyes flew open. A voice shouted down from the top of the wall. Nathan looked up. It was Duke Godrickson. Master Hayfield, what is it? Nathan shouted back. They're underneath the ground. Get off the wall! Nathan rushed out toward the battlefield. He extended his spiritual senses and detected some activity in the middle belfry, one still standing. Azure Fortress rests on solid bedrock, but they can make it through with their martial capabilities. Nathan ran as fast as he could, leaping over the few corpses not yet cleared from the battlefield. He soon arrived at the tower and directed his spiritual energy at its wall. Nathan blasted the side of the belfry apart. In the tower was a giant hole in the ground. Nathan leaped down into it. Nathan paused after entering the underground passage. The sight took his breath away. He beheld a network of caverns held up by wooden support beams. Every few beams hung a lantern with a candle lit inside. I heard Captain Hallowell wonder why it took so long for the Vasilians to get here. I guess now we know why. Nathan ventured into the widest passage, the one leading toward the gate. He drew his sunblade slowly, ready to confront whomever he should encounter. But no one was there. The tunnel system felt eerily empty. Nathan rushed forward, counting his steps as he went. Forty? Fifty? I should be below the first wall now. Yet there was still no one there. Sixty. The second one is about here. He turned a corner and saw five Vosselians hacking at bedrock with nether steel picks. He tapped his sword against the wooden beams. The Vosselians turned and froze. Nathan smirked at them. They're unarmed. Sappers. Non-combat troops. Then, his smile faded. He noticed one held a potion, a thick, mulch-red brew. He recognized it as an exceedingly flammable material, explosive in the wrong conditions. Nathan held out his offhand. Do not do anything foolish! The sappers exchanged horrified looks. Sweat poured down their faces. Nathan's heart sank. They know my reputation. The lead sapper spoke. For the god of the forge! He seized a nearby candle. Nathan turned and ran as fast as he could. The lead sapper stuck the candle straight into the potion. The caverns exploded. Nathan ran faster than ever before. Dirt clogged his throat and stung his eyes. He bounced off of walls. The caverns shook like the hardiest of earthquakes, with him as the epicenter. Many feet above, the ground beneath Azure Fortress shifted. Then, the ground beneath the second wall collapsed. An underground shockwave shook the earth underneath the Azure Fortress. 3,000 soldiers and civilians stumbled and struggled to keep their balance. From the central keep of the fortress, Duke Godrickson looked out towards the walls, his mouth fell agape. The ground under the secondary wall collapsed downward, taking the wall with it. After falling about thirty feet, the wall landed. The blue stones shifted under the weight. Some broke free, falling to the ground. Others held firm. The whole structure of the wall sagged, coming within a hair's breadth of collapsing. Godfrey gritted his teeth. He seized his sword and rushed toward the wall. As he rushed down the stairs to the courtyard, 
the Duke could hear the distant sound of Vosselian war cries. <coughs> Nathan coughed as dust and smoke filled his lungs. He pounded his chest to clear his throat, but his coughing only intensified. He breathed in and out, attempting to steady himself, but with every heaving breath, it felt like a thousand tiny knives swarmed inside of him, cutting at his flesh within. Nathan grimaced. He had heard stories of miners choking to death on stones. This will not be my fate. He focused his spiritual energy within himself. Concentrating every ounce of his power, he located the tiny shards of rock that had wormed their way into his system. He sent tendrils of magic into his lungs, grimacing slightly at the discomfort. It felt like breathing in an acrid smell. Not painful, not pleasant either. But he pushed past his cringing body and took another deep breath to calm himself. Focusing, he aimed the tendrils at the tiny shards of stone in his lungs. He picked one out at a time. There were hundreds of them, possibly up to a thousand. He lost count collecting them all together. Finally, he pushed them all into a ball. He took a deep breath, cleansing breath. Now comes the hard part. Nathan reached his magical energy down his throat and pulled out the large stone. His body quaked. The lump in his throat forced itself up his esophagus. Wave after wave of nausea coursed through him. Finally, he could stand it no longer. He fell to his knees and retched with all his might. The heavy rock plopped out of his mouth and landed on the cavern floor. It was about the size of a child's fist. Nathan shook and wiped off his mouth. He struggled up to his feet, keeping his eyes fixed on the gray rock he had just vomited up. So small an object, and it brought me to my knees. He shook his head in wonder. How fragile life was, even to the mightiest of warriors. Duke Godfrey Godrickson climbed up to the top of the sagging blue ruin that used to be the secondary wall of Azure Fortress. In most castles, it was typical for a secondary wall to have its gateway off-center from the first. That way, an enemy battering ram would be unable to maneuver easily between the two, and the attackers would suffer all manner of indignity in getting their ram into the proper position. The Crown Prince's army had effectively made that defensive advantage moot by melting the outer wall and collapsing the inner one. It required more work, but was ultimately more rewarding. The Duke cursed himself that he didn't prepare for an underground attack. But as he stood atop the ruined battlements, Duke Godfrey Godrickson glimpsed a tide of green and gray rush toward the Azure Fortress. It was the army of the Vassalan Empire. Foot soldiers with spears and shields, hordes of men and women on horses. They were finally able to take full advantage of their numerical superiority. The Duke whirled around. Captain Hallowell, High Lord Lucius Lightstone, and Sir Ian Lightstone stood behind him. Godfrey wasted no time and began issuing orders. Captain, get your archers to the walls and lower parts of the mountains if they can reach. Find as much high ground as you can. The captain disappeared and began shouting orders. Lucius, mount up with your men. We must meet this attack head on. The High Lord Lightstone bowed and rushed to his cavalry. Finally, Duke Godrickson turned to Sir Ian. Sir Ian Lightstone, find your brother. We may yet have need of the Demon Knight. Nathan pushed aside debris, rocks, and dirt. He pulled himself out of the hole in the middle belfry. He blinked as the early morning light blasted his senses. He squinted away from the fortress and beheld the charging Vaslan army. He turned to look at the Azure Fortress. To his dismay, the second wall had slumped and now looked like a melting pudding compared to its former glory. It would take little effort for the approaching soldiers to surmount it. Like a wave breaking over rocks, Calandrian horsemen rode over the fallen wall. 
The glittering banner of House Lightstone fluttered in the breeze above them. A yellow shield with a white hand upon it and a pair of forest green laurels adorning it. Nathan ducked within the belfry and quickly scaled the tower, using the stairs and ladders. It was empty. The soldiers had left some time before they started digging the tunnels. After a moment, he pried open the trap door and stood at the very top of the belfry. From this vantage point, he could see the two armies rushing at each other. The Lightstone cavalry had formed into a spear point shape, whilst the Vasselin army spread out like a blanket, ready to cover the overmatched Calandrians. Nathan leaped off the tower and soared toward the center of the Vasselian forces. No more dancing atop horses. When I strike now, I strike to kill. His mother's voice echoed in his head. You do not wish to end this war. You wish to fight it. He shook it away. It was a pointless thought. To win the war was to fight it. They were the same. His body hurled towards his enemies. He brandished his sunblade. Skewering sky strike! Nathan's blade struck the ground right in the center of the enemy's charge. His impact sent a shockwave through the enemy cavalry. The horses around him reared up. Some toppled over. Some stood their ground. All were distracted from the charge. A cheer rose from the Calandrian forces, and soon they were upon the Vasilians. Chaos erupted around Nathan. Horses toppled. Soldiers screamed. Blood spattered. Blades clashed. Nathan set about doing what he did best, ending lives. Nathan's sunblade glowed a bright orange, and he lashed out at the nearby Vasilians. Whenever a soldier got to him, he cut through their defenses easily. One swung a mace at his head. He sliced the soldier's arm off. He caught the man's mace in his offhand and crushed the man's skull with it. Three foot soldiers attacked Nathan at once. He spun his blade in an impossibly quick arc. They raised their blades to defend themselves, but Nathan sliced through all of them, and in one stroke, they collapsed to the ground, blood pouring from their sliced throats. Nathan laughed, exhilarated at the thrill of utter violent chaos. He painted a canvas of violence. Each sword swing was a brush stroke, adding to the ultimate masterpiece. Most Vosselian soldiers fled from Nathan rather than fight him, but occasionally they didn't have a choice. With bodies pressed around them, Nathan merely fought whatever foe ended up before him. Without fail, they fell one by one. Time passed slowly amid the brutal melee. It passed quickly, too. Both realities were present at the same time. Nathan felt the passing of every fraction of a moment as if it were the lifetime of a hundred Aeonians. But after one blink, he would find himself in an entirely different part of the army than he had been before. He glimpsed a wounded Calandrian soldier fighting a young man in gilded armor. Nathan recognized him immediately. He'd seen him across the battlefield the day before. It was Crown Prince Lionel Zorzi. The prince leveled a slash at the wounded warrior. The Calandrian barely deflected the strike and fell backward onto the ground. Lionel raised his sword and brought it down in a stabbing motion. The soldier closed their eyes, ready for the end. The soldier shakily opened their eyes. Lionel Zorzi's blade stuck in the ground right next to his body. Nathan Hayfield stood above him, his blade lightly touching the crown princess. He had redirected the stab, just enough to prevent the soldier from getting killed. Nathan looked at the fallen warrior. Retreat! The soldier didn't need to be told twice. They hopped to their feet and limped off the battlefield. Lionel Zorzi took a deep breath and faced Nathan. The two warriors circled each other. The crown prince smirked at Nathan Hayfield. Now I heard that the demon knight of darkness could destroy an army with a blink of an eye. Where's that warrior? I want to fight him. Nathan raised his sword. 
Stronger men than you have boasted similarly. Few live to regret it. The crown prince swung his sword at Nathan. Nathan parried and quickly lashed out a riposte, slicing the prince's cheek. The crown prince yelped, hopping back. He grabbed his face. A trickle of blood seeped from beneath his fingers. Now it was Nathan's turn to smirk. Need to call a break? I'm sure a wet nurse could suckle you for a moment whilst you regain your strength. The crown prince lunged again. Nathan nimbly stepped aside and slapped the side of Lionel's head with the flat of his blade. Lionel staggered, clutching his head. Why you? He charged Nathan again, swinging his sword wildly. Nathan deflected each blow with ease. Lionel may as well have been wailing on a steel cage for all the good it did him. The crown prince screamed in frustration. Nathan yawned comically, grinning with amusement as his foe's face reddened. Nathan drew back his blade, preparing to attack. A commotion sounded from the other side of the battle. Distracted, Nathan and Lionel turned to face it. A torrent of soldiers pushed forward. When Nathan looked back, Lionel Zorzi was gone. He grunted. "'Tis your lucky day, princeling, at least for now." A royal trumpet sounded. Nathan leaped into the air, hovering just above the commotion. He smiled when he beheld what the fanfare heralded. Duke Godfrey Godrickson, Sir Ian Lightstone, and a hundred Godricksland knights, the ducal retinue, galloped toward the battle. The duke's golden armor glinted in the sunlight. He swung his sword in the air. Rally to me, soldiers! To me! Nathan dove back into the battle, fighting to clear a path for the duke's arrival. A loud shout sounded from the midst of the fighting. An angry war steed broke forth and made for Duke Godrickson. Astride the horse rode Duke Thomas Perrin. Nathan felt a sense of foreboding. He wanted his fight with Godrickson, and he will have it, one way or another. Duke Godrickson pointed his sword to the side. The ducal retinue parted and formed an arc surrounding Duke Thomas and him. The two dukes charged forward, unrelenting forces of nature, bound to each other in victory or desolation. Bella Godrickson stood atop the highest tower in the Azure Fortress. Though the first wall had fallen, and the second stood as a tumble-down shadow of its former self, the flags of houses Godrickson, Lightstone, and Hayfield still flew high above their battered remnants. Using a spyglass, Bella stared out towards the plains, which stretched into Vosslin. The Lightstone cavalry battled in the Vosslin army, steel flashed, and blood sprayed, but she couldn't discern much of anything through the dust and chaos. Occasionally, she glimpsed Nathan Hayfield fly into the air like a dolphin breaching the surface of churning waves. But just like sea creatures taking a breath, Nathan dove back in each time with barely a hesitation. Wherever he was, soldiers fled in terror or fell where they stood. But when she saw her father lead his honor guard to the fray, her heart stopped. She had remarked to herself earlier how noble in bearing her father looked dressed in battle attire. But now that he led his troops against a superior force, her breath caught her in her throat. Why had I ever been afraid for his health? He is a young man, surely, fighting in his prime. From the Vaslan army, a rider emerged to greet them. He wore dark gray armor with the sigil of a melting fox and hammer on his shield. Bella's eyes remained fixed on the spectacle. Now it's time to see the wolf fight the lion. Duke Godfrey Godrickson fixed his eyes upon his foe. Duke Thomas Perrin had long since ditched his quadriga, favoring a warhorse over the chariot. He rushed towards the Calandrians, heedless that he alone was breaking away from the fray to meet the Godrickshall honor guard. Godfrey pointed his sword outward, 
signaling toward his soldiers to spread out. The honor guard complied, galloping their line into a wide arc and giving their duke space. Time seemed to slow as the two dukes' eyes met. They needed not say a word. There was nothing left to be said. All that remained was bloodshed. Their horses charged toward each other, as if drawn together by the relentless forces of time and fate. Thirty years before, the young Marquis, Godfrey Godrickson, guided his horse into the lists. The son of a duke had just been married a fortnight earlier, and his wife, Lenora, watched adoringly from the stands. He blew her a kiss. She responded by tossing a glittery white handkerchief from her seat. The soft token of her affection drifted through the air and settled into Godfrey's hand. The young man, with a full golden beard, put the cloth to his face. He breathed in his new wife's fragrance. The gentle smell of ginger and honeysuckle tantalized his senses. His heartbeat quickened, and his blood surged with passion. His father had insisted he compete in the tournament. But if the young man had his druthers, he would have spent the entire day with Lenora, loving and adoring every inch of her body, mind, and soul. A subtle cough from a squire brought the duke back to attention. He looked across the list. Mounted on an austere black horse was his challenger, a teenage boy about ten years his junior. His opponent had chestnut brown hair and fiery eyes. He radiated the arrogance of a young man who had yet to face a conquest he couldn't overcome. Godfrey gritted his teeth. Such men were born to make the world miserable until warriors of greater valor felled them. But this tournament was a show of peace betwixt Calandria and Vosselin, so the Marquis was not to disturb the proceedings with his harsh words. Yet, within the joust, there was no ill way to win. A squire handed Godfrey his helm. Godfrey hastily tucked the kerchief from his bride into his breastplate, through his neck. He then took the helm and placed it upon his head. Across the list, his opponent did the same. Their squires each handed them a lance. Godfrey took his and aimed the point toward his enemy. In a few moments, he would shatter the point against the Vosslander's shield, and Lenora would cheer his name. He hoisted his hand toward the wooden seats, where Calandrians, noble and commoner, sat and stood in rapt attention. They cheered for him, their chants echoing throughout the tournament grounds. Godfrey turned his attention to the other side of the arena, where the Vosslander stood. He knew that part of his task in the tournament was to be an enemy to them, Yet his father had long since instilled in him that he could fill such roles honorably. So Godfrey bowed before his opponent's foes. A scattering of jeers and boos greeted him, but some respected the gesture and returned some polite claps. The knight on the black horse had no interest in the same courtesy. He picked up his lance and readied himself. The two faced each other, their horses pawing at the ground. The trumpets sounded. Two flags lowered down in front of the horses. A herald stood forth and proclaimed the competition at the top of his lungs. Marquess Godfrey Godrickson, stand you ready? Godfrey nodded. And Sir Thomas Perrin, stand you ready? The arrogant young man bowed ever so slightly. The herald lifted his hand. The crowd fell silent. The herald threw his hand down in a chopping motion. The flags lifted. The two young men urged their horses forward. Their horses breathing, the rider's determination, and the skill with which they charged each other echoed across time. Wrinkles formed upon their cheeks. Their hair thinned and whitened. Battles twixt happiness and joy pushed and pulled their features, warping the young, virile pair would first vied for glory upon the plains of honor into seasoned old soldiers, ones who understood the bitter truth of war. Forty years after their first bout, 
the horses of Thomas Perrin and Godfrey Godrickson again came together in conflict. Their swords repelled one another in a shower of sparks. Godfrey and Thomas rode past each other and turned their horses back to face one another. The battle surged around them, spears and arrows seemingly unwilling to touch this sacred confrontation. Both riders spurred their horses forward again. Both knew that this was no mere tournament this time. Chivalric conduct was no more a binding force of law than prayer was a contraceptive. In real war, all laws were meaningless until some honorable advocate arrived after many lay slain. As they galloped towards each other, Duke Thomas slipped off the side of his horse, hanging his body over the side. Duke Godrickson swung down at his opponent, only to find him out of reach. But Thomas Perrin only had to lift his sword, and his nether steel blade sliced deep into the enemy's horse's exposed flank. Godrickson's war steed whinnied in pain and toppled forward, throwing Godfrey out of his saddle. Duke Godrickson tumbled across the plain. His body stopped 20 paces away from where his horse fell. Though every muscle and every tendon in his body screamed with agony, the Duke seized his fallen sword and clambered to his feet. He held his hilt with both hands and raised his sword. In this position, he was best prepared to fight Duke Perrin or any mounted soldier. Thomas Perrin reared his horse in the air. Astride his mighty animal, Thomas looked more the part of a warrior than Godfrey felt, but he was ready to fight the younger, dangerous man. Duke Thomas sneered at Duke Godrickson and charged again. When Duke Thomas rushed forward, Duke Godrickson was ready for him. He sidestepped the charging warhorse and slashed straight through his enemy's saddle. Thrown off balance, Duke Thomas tumbled off his horse, taking his saddle with him. The terrified animal bolted, vanishing into the fray. Godfrey strode forward and attacked his fallen foe. Duke Godrickson chopped down at Duke Perrin. The Vosslander rolled to the side, avoiding the strikes. He sliced through the saddle straps, holding his legs in place, and leaped to his feet. He blocked the next several strikes with his enemy and spun his blade in a dramatic arc. Godfrey leaped back, and the two men stared at each other. Not so different from a tournament, is it, Godfrey? Duke Godrickson looked at his enemy with disdain. You know right well it is, but I never held any respect for those who confuse life and death with jocularity and disport. And I never had respect for old fools like you. You have no sense of fun. Duke Godrickson ground his heel into the dirt. I have plenty of time for your type of fun. He lunged, blasting spiritual energy at his foe. Duke Perrin made a sign with his hand. Duke Godfrey's blood magic stopped there, halting as if striking an invisible shield. Duke Godrickson brought his sword down at Duke Perrin. Thomas dodged and struck back. Godfrey didn't raise his sword. He rolled his shoulder into the strike. The nether steel sword skittered away. The Duke of Godricksland's armor was scratched, but not penetrated. He swung his sword at Duke Perrin, but the Vosslander pulled the same trick, letting his armor block the attack and returning with equal force. The two dukes battled back and forth, striking at each other's weak points, but blocking their opponent's attacks just as readily. If it were a tournament, each sword strike would count as a point, or more if it was to the head or chest. But this type of duel, where lives ended all around them, was not played with those rules. There was only one point to score between heated rivals on a field of blood, death. Duke Godrickson advanced, forcing the Perrin's Land Duke to retreat. He watched his foe's attacks and redirects with interest. Years of peace, and he hasn't slowed even a moment. He's been training, itching to get back to the blood. Sweat choked the inside of Duke Godrickson's armor. He knew that if he were to remove his helmet, steam would burst forth. Yet he struggled on. 
Mastering one's spiritual warrior forms was an excellent way to fight against aging. But Duke Godrickson felt the gulf in age between them in this duel. As the older man tired, the younger one stayed consistent, his vitality as strong as when the duel began. But Godfrey grunted in frustration. But then an idea struck him. Thomas has been preparing for this, a fair fight. If I am to win, I need to fight dishonorably. Duke Godrickson cried out and struck the ground before him, channeling his spiritual energy into the strike. A cloud of dirt blew up into Thomas Perrin's face. He cried out in frustration, striking blindly as he blinked rapidly. When the dust cleared, he saw Duke Godfrey Godrickson leaping down upon him. He lifted his sword, trying to block him, but it was too late. Duke Godfrey's blade came down with all its might, and Thomas Perrin's bloody helmet skittered across the battlefield. Roderick Godrickson, Donna Lightstone, and Sarah Hale fled the Vosslin army's camp. The tents they set on fire soon engulfed the whole camp. The fire distracted enough of their pursuers that they made good headway, but Roderick's leg wound slowed them down considerably. Eventually, when they were sure no one was following them, they ducked into a small grove of trees to hide. Roderick fell on his back, crying out in pain. Sarah Hale shushed Roderick. Are you mad? Do you want us to be caught and killed? Roderick replied through gritted teeth. Oh, I cry your mercy. I was not thinking clearly. Due to the arrow wound I received saving your life? Sarah rolled her eyes. She turned to Donna, who was cutting at Roderick's leggings. We have not much time. The fires will only distract them for so long. Donna sawed away his leggings, peeling away the bloody strips from the wound. Sarah rushed over to a nearby tree, keeping an eye out for any incoming Vosslanders. Donna carefully cut at Roderick's leggings so she didn't slice his skin. Wherefore did you not tell me of this sooner? Roderick grimaced with pain. I thought you might slow down to help. We needed to use every possible uh, 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 second. Donna laughed. I might have left you behind. <laughs> that was a worry, too. In truth, Roderick didn't know why he kept his wound to himself. When it happened, he just instinctively kept quiet. It might have been his embarrassment at receiving a wound in the first place. It might have been that he didn't want Donna to owe him anything. Or it might be that it made him feel like the fool, the easily led dupe whom his grandfather and Donna had been mocking for years. Donna grimaced. The bloody bolt stuck deep into Roderick's leg. Pulling it out would risk severing tendons and possibly even cause the loss of his leg entirely. I'm sorry, Roderick, but I am no Amelia Hayfield. I can maybe stop the bleeding, but we'll need to get you to a proper healing ward, or else you could lose a leg. Stop the bleeding, then. You need not wait for my say-so. Donna nodded, no quips to hand. She tore off strips of cloth from his torn trouser leg, and she bound the wound. She removed her standard healing kit and put some poultice on the wound. It would soothe the pain, but there was nothing she could do until the healers at Azure Fortress pulled the shaft from his bloodied calf. Ugh. Roderick gasped in pain as Donna tightened the wraps. It wasn't a good pain, but it felt helpful. Sarah stared and ducked down. She hissed at the other two as she crawled to them. Someone's coming! Donna ducked down. All three flattened themselves against the greenery. A few horses galloped past the grove, ignoring the tall bushes and verdant trees. Sarah poked her head up. Huh? They're not interested in seeking us out. They're heading toward the front. Donna gulped. Oh no, the attack has resumed. Sarah tapped Roderick on the shoulder. Are you well enough to move? 
Roderick grimaced. I have no choice in this matter, do I? Sarah grinned. Good man. On your feet, now. Azure Fortress awaits. Their stomachs sank. The passing horses turned and galloped back in the escapee's direction. Sarah held up a finger to her mouth. She crawled over to the nearest tree and began to climb. It was a thick oak, so it didn't move an inch under her weight, but soon, Roderick and Donna lost sight of her in the branches. Roderick looked up at Donna. If I should fail to make it... Donna slapped him. Roderick's eyes widened in surprise. Well, if I perish... She slapped him with her other hand. Roderick clutched his cheeks. May I complete my query, oh Mistress Cruelty? Not if it involves talking of dying. Say your piece, but if you say you might die, I will hit you again. Roderick laughed. I have heard of healers using harsh methods, but you cut me to the quick. Donna glared at him. Roderick lifted his hands, conceding. I wish my aunt to remember me as I am, someone fighting for a righteous cause, not someone tricked by foul intention. Donna nodded, understanding. She reared her hand back as if to slap. Roderick preemptively winced. She smirked. She patted Roderick on the cheek. You will be able to show her that. I am certain you will live. Now, ready your blade. We might have others to cut through afore we worry what story we shall spin for our relatives. Roderick grimaced and drew his broadsword. He lay on the ground. He would be useless in a fight, but at least he could defend himself. All of a sudden, three horsemen burst into the grove. They were wearing full battle armor and surrounded the two Calandrians. One of them spoke to another. Are they ours or theirs? The second aimed a spear at Donna. Speak your name and dissemble not. I can tell the truth from a lie. Donna opened her mouth. The second soldier flicked his wrist. Donna yelped. A trickle of blood flowed out from a scar the horse soldier had left on her cheek. The three Voslanders laughed as one. <laughs> we can tell the face of an equivocator. You have one. Any word that tongue tells is built on a foundation of lies. Were thou the one who set our tents ablaze? Donna laid her hand on her sword. These riders had no interest in finding out their true culpability. They wanted sport, nothing more. She spoke boldly in her native accent. You care not, so I will care not to answer. Why do you not finish what you came here to do? The riders laughed. They hopped off their horses one by one and drew their swords. Roderick stiffened on the ground, his hands clutching his sword. Struggle not, milady. There'll be a nice warm cage for you back at our camp. A feral scream hollered from the trees above. A human-sized shape plummeted down, landing on the second soldier. Donna heard a sword drawing and saw the spray of blood. The other two soldiers turned in surprise. Sarah Hale drew herself up to her full height. She opened her arms wide. You wish me to return to your cage? Come and take me. The one to her left side lunged. Sarah wasted no time. Instead of attacking the foe who was attacking her, she pivoted and twirled, slashing at the other Voslander. He fell without a sound, dead. Donna leaped to her feet and plunged her blade through the chest of the last remaining soldier. His mouth opened in a silent scream his eyes widening in horror and pain. Then, life left his eyes, and he collapsed. The three Calandrians looked at each other. Sarah gestured at one of the Voslander's horses. Well, Roderick, I have a horse for thee. Donna, Sarah, and Roderick chuckled. Then they laughed, heartily, painfully. It only took a new brush with death to put joy back into their lives again.
The three horses and their riders escaped the woods, and their mouths dropped as they beheld a terrifying sight. The colossal Vaslan army stretched before them, rows upon rows of well-armed, fresh troops who hadn't even seen a single moment of fighting yet. At the front of the vast retinue was a chaotic hurricane of blood, dust, and blades. Out of the 10,000-strong army, the massive melee only involved a thousand. The rest of the Vaslan army pressed forward, slowly and subtly driving the melee back toward the Azure Fortress itself. Smoke billowed out from its crumbling blue walls. Bodies littered the plains before them, alongside two stranded siege towers and one fallen one. The army seemed indifferent to the broken bodies and siege weaponry it left behind. They marched inexorably forward. Donna, Roderick, and Sarah all looked at each other. There was only one way they could make it to the Azure Fortress, through the Vaslan army as well as past the Calandrian melee, all while wearing the uniforms of slain Vaslan soldiers. Wordlessly, they urged their steeds forward and joined the galloping cavalry lining up for their next charge. The chaos on the field equally matched the chaos raging within the healing quarters of Azure Fortress. After their campaign in Shrouded Cloud City, Amelia was used to working in cramped conditions. Azure Fortress had much more spacious rooms, better equipped to handle many wounded. Yet the battle was sending so many more casualties that it was just as packed as it had been in Skylarland, possibly even more so. Amelia rushed from patient to patient, addressing their wounds and sending them to the correct healers. Some of the wounded were beyond help, with severed appendages and mortal wounds, and some even had no apparent wounds, but they screamed and hollered, their senseless words looping over each other again and again. Amelia felt her heartbreak for these poor souls. Only time will heal the wounds they are suffering, if they can be healed at all. Amelia? Amelia looked around, confused. She heard someone call her name, but no one was there. Hello? Amelia! Tis I, Baylor! Amelia froze, shocked. Baylor had not been able to leave his room in days. How was he speaking to her? How are you speaking to me, Baylor? No need to speak your answers aloud. Just think them. Oh, well then. Hello, Baylor. Amelia, come to my quarters. I need your help. Amelia looked around. Everything was well in hand, so she rushed toward the main keep and the guest room wherein Baylor Graham was confined. She found Baylor sitting on his cot, his sightless visage turned toward the door. Ah, Amelia, tis good to see thee. You can see me? Oh, I cry your mercy. Force of habit, the phrase. Help me to my feet, would you please? Amelia cocked her head sternly to the side. She placed her hands on her hips. Now, Baylor, you know you are not yet well enough to fight. Baylor nodded impatiently. My body has not been well enough to fight for a long time, yet it has served me well in that regard. But we must hurry. Wherefore? Something terrible is about to happen. The army is being driven back towards our gates. I, I can feel it. Amelia nodded. We need to move all of the wounded and civilians out of the fortress. Aye. But what if we can win? Baylor cocked his head back thoughtfully. Oh, I know we can win. But warriors fight better when they know their loved ones are safe. Come now. We have not a moment to lose. <sighs> Amelia lifted Baylor from the cot, and together they limped down the stairs toward the healing ward. Baylor, your wisdom might be the turning point in this war. Oh, good. I will let you know once I find some. Duke Godrickson stood over the body of his fallen foe. His bloody sword rested at his side. His victory didn't fill him with satisfaction, joy, or excitement. 
The warrior he had clashed with in the past, a once respected rival, lay in the dirt. His heart felt hollow. Sir Kyle, his longtime advisor, rushed up beside him. His armor was battered and bloody. My lord, their numbers are too great. We need to retreat to the higher ground. Duke Godrickson looked over the melee. He could see Vosslanders falling to Calandrian blades left, right, and center. But for every two he saw fall, at least one Calandrian perished. Our numbers are too few to broker such a tragedy. He turned to Sir Kyle. Sound retreat, Sir Kyle. We will bottleneck them at the second wall. Sir Kyle nodded and signaled to the trumpeters. Upon hearing the trumpet blasts, the Lightstone cavalry turned and retreated, slicing through the remaining Vosselian infantry on their way back up the hill. Nathan Hayfield flew over the Duke. My lord, why do we retreat? Swinging his sunblade, Nathan deflected a crossbow bolt from the air without even looking at it. Duke Godrickson gestured toward the fortress. They are pushing us back to the walls. We can regroup there and retain the defensive advantage. Nathan nodded. I will hold them here and save the stragglers left behind. Duke Godrickson saluted Nathan. Sir Kyle brought the Duke a horse. Godfrey put his foot in the stirrup and swung to the saddle. Nathan returned to the fray as Calandrian after Calandrian disengaged from the battle. They left Duke Thomas Perrin lying in a pool of blood in the dirt. The horses struggled to find purchase as they climbed up the collapsed second wall, but eventually the survivors of the Lightstone Cavalry made it back up to the fortress. Duke Godfrey Godrickson stood atop the wall and looked down over the approaching Vosselin forces. A crossbow bolt flew by, missing the Duke's head by a hair's breadth. Godfrey didn't flinch. Sir Kyle shouted in alarm. My lord, get down behind the walls! The Duke turned and climbed down the gentle slope. Sir Kyle, are Captain Hallowell and his archers still in position? Aye, sir. Signal them. Sir Kyle rushed off. Duke Godrickson stood with his soldiers just beyond the crest of the brick hill that was once the second wall. He couldn't see the approaching enemy, but trusted the captain to know when to start the arrow storm. He gripped his blade. He would be damned if he would let others stand in the line without him there. Donna, Roderick, and Sarah joined the cavalry charge just as the Calandrians broke and fled. Their approach caused another problem, however. The fleeing soldiers from Godric's land, Hayland, and Skylar land climbed over the second wall, which now resembled a brick mound. The only way for the Vosleans to get into the fortress was to climb over it, and only a fool would assume it was not a trap. Nathan Hayfield flew in and out of the soldiers, blocking arrows and striking down those who pursued the fleeing Calandrians. Sarah Hale laughed. Then, she immediately covered her mouth in fear of revealing herself, but she still couldn't suppress her giggles. He enjoys flying far too much. As she watched her old friend zip around through the air, she couldn't help but wish she was slightly closer that he could swoop in, snatch her up, and take her home. But that wasn't possible. Home didn't exist while war raged. Home wasn't home, while Dunstan Perrin could draw breath without suffering for his crimes. A shrill noise blew, signaling all the captains. The captain nearest to the three Calandrians shouted an order. Phalanx! Now! All the horse riders dismounted. Sarah, Roderick, and Donna followed suit. Roderick walked carefully on his leg. He still grimaced in pain, but it seemed the poultice had helped alleviate some of his distress. The Vosselian infantry all crunched together, pushing and jostling Donna, Roderick, and Sarah until they were uncomfortably shoulder to shoulder with a tide of Vosslanders. Another captain hollered an order. 
Shields! Aloft! The whole unit raised their shields. The soldiers in the front held them before them. The soldiers behind held them above their heads. Sarah, Donna, and Roderick held their stolen shields above their heads as if to block rain from falling. But they knew it wasn't rain they were to block. Forward! Advance! The Vosslanders marched forward, shielded in their turtle-shell-like formations. From far above, they looked like ugly beetles, their dark gray shields protecting them from predators. And these beetles moved steadily forward, closing the ground between them and the Azure Fortress. Knock! Captain Hallowell stood on the side walls of Azure Fortress with the remaining archers. They were facing inward toward the fortress, but at an angle. The very moment the Vosslanders crossed the ruin of the first wall, they would loose their arrows. Captain Hallowell squinted. The first squadron of shielded Vosslanders came into view. Of course. Phalanx. It's a savvy play. Draw! The archers drew back their arms, tensing their bowstrings. The next two units appeared, probably forty more Vosslanders under shields. Loose! The first wave of arrows mainly bounced harmlessly off of the shields. One or two Vosslanders fell, quarrels striking them in their exposed eyes or feet. But the shields shifted every time one soldier fell, protecting that flank again. Five more beetles appeared withstanding torrent after torrent of arrows. Nathan Hayfield flew above it all, gliding in a huge arc. He seemed focused on where best he could met out destruction without jeopardizing the lives of his fellow soldiers. Below, Duke Godrickson shouted up at the catapults on the towers. Launch! Massive rocks soared from the catapults and collided with a few marching phalanges. Though they could withstand arrows until the sun burst, the shields of Vosslanders were no match for a catapult's projectile. The hurtling rocks destroyed the few phalanges they crashed into, scattering the soldiers. If they were lucky, they died instantly, crushed by the weight of the flying boulder. If they were unlucky, they were scattered and fell victim to the ever-present hail of arrows. Though deterred, The phalanx that made it to the crest of the hill broke free, and the Vosslanders rushed at the Calandrian army, and the brutal melee began all over again. Having grown up in a particularly rainy part of Godric's land, Sarah Hale was used to the pitter-patter of rain on a rooftop. She didn't expect how similar the clanking of arrows falling on a phalanx would be to those cozy childhood memories. Except in her childhood... Rain didn't mean instant death. It did now, and that made an impressive difference. The phalanx next to Sarah, Donna, and Roderick suddenly scattered, and the sounds of screaming and crunching bodies filled their ears. A catapult's projectile demolished it, along with all the souls within. Sarah, Donna, and Roderick looked at each other, fear in their eyes. They all shared the same thoughts. Is this how our lives end? Crushed to death in the midst of the Vosslan army? At the hands of our own kin? The dirt under their feet gave way. It was now stone they walked on. Their protective beetle moved up a hill. They were now climbing the wall, close to their friends. And danger in an entirely different form. Once free from their phalanx, the Vosslanders charged down the hill straight into the awaiting spears and swords of Calandria. Many soldiers, thrilled with having survived the gauntlet of arrows, swiftly found themselves immediately slain by the prepared hands of their enemies. A well-known factor in war is that the attacking army, victorious or not, typically loses more soldiers than the defenders. The Calandrians turned this truism into art. Sir Ian Lightstone stood amid the front lines, only a few soldiers away from Duke Godrickson. 
His spiritual energy still felt depleted from using his gleaming aegis against Simon Perrin, but his sword was just as sharp as any magic could conjure. He fought admirably, striking down foe after foe artfully and honorably. A Voslander with a pair of axes attacked him. Sir Ian parried one axe with his shield and another with his sword. He then smacked his helm into his enemies. Though slightly dizzy, Sir Ian fought against his senses and struck down his foe. Another swung a spear at him. Sir Ian dodged the long spear and swung his blade at them, but was unable to reach them due to the superior length of their spear. Thinking quickly, at their next thrust, Sir Ian severed the spear. He then charged forward and rammed his sword into their neck. He pulled his blade home, and a spray of blood coated his vision red. Sir Ian turned blindly, swinging his sword. Ian, stop! Sir Ian halted his blade. He rubbed his eyes, clearing them. His sword was poised a hair's breadth away from his sister Donna's neck. Donna! Forgetting everything about where they were, Sir Ian dropped his sword and shield and embraced his sister. Warm tears filled his eyes. Where were you? As if to answer, a hand tapped his shoulder. He turned, and standing there was Sarah Hale and Roderick Godrickson. Sir Ian blinked in shock. You have a mighty tale to tell, I'd wager. Sarah laughed. Sir Ian turned back and embraced his sister. You are marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. Sir Ian and Donna Lightstone gasped. A Vosleyan soldier had taken advantage of their intimate moment and spitted them both with a spear. Frozen in shock, they struggled for breath and to free themselves from the pole arm. The long poniard pierced through the side of Sir Ian's chest and Donna's shoulder. Sarah Hale roared in fury and rushed toward the spear-wielding Voslander. With a single strike, she took his head off. Roderick sliced his sword down and severed the spear, separating the brother and sister. He caught Donna and held her up. Sir Ian wobbled on his feet, a chunk of spear sticking out from his side. Meanwhile, Sarah Hale was dissatisfied with merely slaying the pikeman. She wailed on the body, hacking it again and again and again. Roderick grabbed her and hauled her off the dead man. "'Tis no use, Sarah. Quickly, we need to get them to the healing ward." He grabbed Donna again, and Sarah seized Ian. Together, they rushed away from the battle. The three adventurers made it home only to have yet another brush with death. But the tide of Voslanders had yet to abate. In the front of the defense, Duke Godrickson swung his bloody sword. He cried out orders. Sir Kyle, obedient as ever, stood by his side, staunchly defending his lord, even as his wounds mounted. Duke Godrickson beheaded another soldier of Voslan, and then he heard a roar come from the other side of the wall. For a moment, he thought it must be some tamed beast that Voslan had won over to their side. But no. When he looked over, he recognized it as a yell from a man. Godfrey! Face me! You bloody coward! Standing atop the wall was a soldier in dark gray armor. His hair was matted to his head, and a deep gash laced his face from the top corner of his forehead to the downward curl of his jaw. It was Duke Thomas Perrin. <laughs>